Hello, if you're listening, um, we'll be with you now in just a second. Ravi, are you there? Hello. Hello, I can hear you now. All right, cool. <clears throat> My mic was muted. That's all right. Um, I think we're good to go. Somebody might let me know if they can't see it, or um, either on. I'll keep an eye on Twitter as we go. So, um, yeah. So if anybody has any questions, so you're listening in, and you want me to ask anything, either Twitter or if you're on the Google Hangout. Um, sure. If anything comes up here. Um, if anything comes up on my Twitter, I will let you know. Yeah, okay. And I think for anyone who's joined officially on the Google Hangout, um, there's a question and answers thing there. But as I said, I'll keep an eye on Twitter as we go. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I think we'll get started. Um, just one second. Yeah. Okay, everything looks good. Okay. So, first of all, thanks a million for doing this. Um, yeah, number two in, in the series, and uh, yeah, we'll just see how we get on. So, um, so as, as it, I, I think we'll just start. If you want to just give a bit of a brief introduction to who you are and, and what your sort of current role is. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks again. Thanks a lot for inviting me, and also I want to thank you for organizing this series. Uh, I I saw the first one with Brian Prestige, who I met, and I respect his work a lot. Uh, so it's it's great to be here and uh, thanks for calling me. Um, so as I put it in my intro, I started working for the Sounders uh, in the beginning of last season, and before that I was working at Microsoft for about six and a half years. I used to do a lot of data analysis at Microsoft in my job. Uh, what we use a lot of um, data of user behavior, and then and then look at literally hundreds of metrics of how a new feature is performing uh, compared to an older feature, whether to ship a new feature or not, um, and and then and then you apply a lot of statistical methods to that. And I'm always uh, fascinated by soccer stats. And you know, as more recently, I started taking uh, a lot of interest in it while I was working at Microsoft. And and around two years ago, I. I decided to quit uh, in March of 2012, and the goal was that I gave myself like I was trying to do two things at a time, like at evenings and weekends, try to work on the numbers things in um, soccer and and daytime work the Microsoft, and it's really hard to balance the both. So I decided to take okay, I'm gonna take six months off and then try to get a job. In football, so my goal was I have about six to nine months, and then after that, if I don't get it, the fallback was to go back to software. Um, luckily, uh, my risk taking was rewarded, and and that you know, and I'm here to tell the story. Um, so that's kind of the backstory to this. Um, for the Sounders, what I do is this is more different from a traditional performance analyst role where they do a lot more video and things. What I do is a lot more. Uh, it's an integrated role of the overall performance and all the all the data in the club, uh, managing, setting up an infrastructure for that. Um, so what I do, um, I'll just list out things that I do. So when I started off, I set up. So I was called on by our performance manager, Dave Tenney at Micro, at, uh, at Sounders. He wanted me on board because he was running out of Excel sheets where he was carrying a lot of data. Yeah, of basically a lot of data from GPS, from training, and yep. and then the heart rate monitors, and you know a lot of data like that, more of the physical side of things. And he wanted he wanted to have a more um, holistic architecture and actually go forward. And I think Sounders organization is very good that way in that they always look at the bigger picture and want to have um, or and uh, they have always been positive to for the numbers based approach. Uh, everybody in the coaching staff is very positive towards it, and, and you know they'll always question you, but they, there's always an inherent idea that okay, we can gain some advantage out of it. Um, and, and so that, I'll just stop you there for one second. How did you get spotted? Is it was it true the work you were doing weekends and on your blog and that type of stuff? Is that how you came? Yeah, that's part of it. 
yeah, that's part of it. And and then I got to meet. So I I go to Sounders games as a fan in, before I joined too. And I got to meet Dave at one of uh, after a game, um, and we were just talking about football. Um, and mostly generally not about numbers, but talking about football, and I told what I do at, um, at, at Microsoft. Um, and, and then um, and, and then we met again the second time, and the second time we met, he talked about some of the challenges he was having with, uh, with, managing, with managing his data at that point. So I took some sample data from him. This was actually before last season, like, like sometime in 2012. Yeah. Um, so and then I actually would do some work for him and then meet him at a Starbucks or some coffee shop and then just show him what what can be done and and then he would take take that back to the to the team and so it was a little bit of a exercise like that for about two three months and after that I um, you know at the end of uh, 2012 season so in MLS the season is within the year so starts in March ends in December. So at the end of the 2012 season, he said, "If you want to come on board," and I was I was happy um, to to join the team. So that's how it started. Yeah. So it partly started because I I started building some reputation and you know showing some of the work I do uh, with the football side of things, and that helped me a lot. And also I've been to I think you know in all this, there's also a bit of meeting a lot of people at the Sloan Sports Conference um, yeah. three years ago in 2000. I think I think the the conference of 2012 was when I met a lot of people that are in that are very you might know all of them and I think I saw you last year yeah. but we didn't really connect much <laughs> I saw you I met you <laughs> yeah probably two minutes uh, so yes I think that conference and meeting the people there and seeing what they're doing and and you know help and and the fact that I already had like ability to write my own programs and analyze data the background that I I've been able to build from working at Microsoft. It's really helped me uh, make make progress quickly. And do you think, like, because obviously in a lot of cases, performance analysts in in the UK or in Europe, they come from the coaching background, and then they they end up as as analysts. You've you've obviously come from a totally different sphere where you're the programmer, numbers type guy. Has it been hard? to come from that background and, and, and be involved with the, the club or the coaches on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I wouldn't say hard, but I think it's a big learning experience because the thing is that once I got in, you just understand, like, you know, we have coaches that have been coaching or played in the game total about 50 years, 40 years. So, I mean, I for me, the first few months while I was building my data infrastructure, I was just learning from all those people, like how they how they coach, how they how they practice, or how they make the drills, and you know how, what how do we prepare for the games, the video sessions. So I was just learning um, that side of things. Um, so and and at the same time, I was trying to provide value, show that you know this is this is uh, you know the number side of things, and get some show some value that what I, I'm here to. To add value to the whole organization, um, so yeah, it was a challenge in the beginning, but but it's just it's still a learning experience. Sometimes you um, you think that um, old, I mean the, the the term like the old school coaches versus like numbers approach. I I think there is a lot of overlap. I think a lot of them, even though they don't probably do fancy or even Excel sheets or anything, but they really count things in their mind and they they have so much memory and so much information that I always try to get from them like print out stuff so that I can improve myself and improve my my output um, so yeah so it's been it's a great experience coming from the other side because you're pretty much like an outsider because you I've never played football at any level as, as a professional not, not a professional semi-professional only like rec league stuff yeah. so uh, and and in school and, and you know I was a better cricket player than than football player so and was was it as expected? So obviously from the outside you had a view maybe what the clubs should or shouldn't be doing and then you're on the inside so was it what you expected when you got in there or not? Um, I think uh, there is a certain level of things that you think, I mean from the outside I would say that the picture is definitely very different and um, one thing that I've noted when I got in is the, the amount of constraints 
and the the magnitude of the constraints that you work with um, for example. or the coaches for example um like i would say for example something like you look at stats from outside and say you see you see uh, some guy having very high goals for 90 minutes or something like that just just an example yeah. um, but but he's not playing enough or or he's not starting every game then you go inside and you realize that the constraints they're working with so maybe the guy that maybe the player that has that high goal high goal scoring ratio can't play 90 minutes or he might not be able to play 90 minutes couple of games and then then he might get injured or something yeah. so things like those are like are the kind of constraints or sometimes the other part is also you want certain level of uh, say defensive work rate from players and you know some of those some some players do it some players don't and some players can be asked to do or told to do some players even if you tell them they I mean you know I guess classic uh, example is maybe someone like Berbato or someone who everybody seems to complain that okay he's great he has some amazing skills but he's not going to track back or he's not going to help with defense a lot yeah, so I think some of them are visible from outside. Like I think Berbatov. I mean, I still I like that player. I'm not trying to demean, yeah. you know, in demeaning way. But I think I uh, I think I learned a lot about those constraints uh, that that people operate within. Same thing with scouting budgets. Uh, I think those are all things that you learn once you get in, and 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 then you realize that okay, so this might be the best player available uh, on the market, but we may not be able to get him for five different reasons. So you might, be a, for... you might be a little bit, not suggesting you were unkind, but you might be a little bit kinder to the slower progress that's maybe made in clubs. Now that you've seen the inside, you can see why maybe things are slowed down in terms of development or anything. Yeah, I, I think I think the, yeah, I agree. I think the, the progress is slower, not just because of, of, um, of, because they don't like numbers or they don't, want to do anything stats based I think a lot of clubs do get it um, do know the or see the importance and see the value in doing that uh, doing numbers based approach and and um, and you know incorporating it as one more tool in the whole decision making process I think that's the important thing it's never one versus the other I think all of them have have a role but you know but the, the constraints and the different limitations they work within and the and also the like also time timing constraints like you are preparing for a game, um, you need certain things to be done before a certain time. Uh, you know, like basically you have a basically very regimented schedule. If you're playing Saturday to Saturday, you have yeah. things to be done each day, um, and where everything fits in. And yeah, so I do. Um, yeah, I do appreciate. I do appreciate that in in the fact that I think. Everybody is trying to move in the right direction, but I think it will take time. Very good. Okay, and then, so I interrupted you, but back to, I suppose, to give us an overview of your role. So you, you handle effectively all of the performance data, not just, yes. let's say, ball contact. So you might, you might just give us an idea of what all your data contains. So I'll, I'll just go, so what I built is, so I'll just give an overview of what I built at Saunders. I built this um, huge database, centralized location to store data from all the data we collect. Now that includes, so we, we have GPS in every training. So, I mean, all our players wear GPS, so we get a lot of data. And it's a very granular data. It's not just a top level in terms of just total distance covered. or, But we, we go as far as, what each exercise means in terms of of a load for each player. Uh, like if it's a 4v4 with uh, small goals, what does it mean? If it's a 9v9 with uh, big goals, what does it mean? Uh, and uh, and also we know the area of the field, so we know pretty much we, we've gotten to a place where we're able to quantify that, you know, fairly accurately. Um, so so they were the GPS, they also were heart rate monitors during the game, during the practice. And um, we we have that data, um, and what we create every day is is a, what I create is a call a training report, which is based on which tells how much work they have done physically output, um, and what was the how much work their heart has done in terms of internally. Like basically, it's a, I look at it as a a, a, a 
a good analogy is like an engine, how much torque needs to be generated to to generate certain accelerations and certain yeah. level of cover certain distance. Um, so yeah, so we, we use that to see who is fit, who is not, um, who is trending well, who is not trending well. Uh, so that's a daily process. So I have built a database to collect all this and so that I can just query by name of a player and the training date and I get all the data or just the name of a player and I can get like a series, time series data. Um, so all of this I built um, this plus um, we have, um, we get match data from from like, we, we have a company called uh, Match Analysis that does um, the camera thing like ProZone. Uh, yeah. they have um, they have cameras in all the MLS stadiums and it has a deal with MLS we get that data uh, every after every game um, for our and we also have a reserve league where our reserve team play um, and, and for reserve games we for home games at least we wear the GPS units for the game because for MLS games we're not allowed to wear and okay. we get data so that's so, so those are all the type of data that I put together in one place and then and then have a reporting infrastructure, which, where we can pull any kind of report that the coaches want or or, or something. And that must take quite a bit of coordination, obviously on the programming side, but even I presume finding out what's important to the S and C coaches, what's important to the physiotherapist, yeah. what's important to the analyst, all takes a bit yeah. of time and, and experience. Yeah, it, it took me a while because I think my last year, most of the time I was. Probably starting. I started in January or early January. So, and then two through June or July uh, was mostly like building everything. So, p stuff goes into one place. There were still pieces left that I finished at the end of the season, but um, but yeah, it takes a lot of time. And also, it's it's an evolutionary process. So, if you look at the reports I was sending even three months ago and the reports I'm sending now, it they change a lot because we we are we are constantly like evolving based on feedback from the coaches, based on feedback from um, you know from the head coach, from the assistant coaches, from uh, strength and conditioning, and and the, the way the way I work is that yeah, so I put something in front of the the, the decision makers, and and then you know they say okay, I like this, I don't like this, I want to see this something else. Then I will I'll put something else in front of them. Yeah, it was a it was a trial and error at the beginning. Um, it's mo more of it was last year. I think this year it was pretty streamlined. And then this year I traveled with the team in the preseason, so there was a lot more work done in during that time, like to streamline what are we going to monitor, um, and what what is the changes. So, so yeah, it, it is a lot of work to build the whole thing together, um, and then. And then after that, just just incrementally changing things, and and I think the key point is that uh, we uh, I never try to overwhelm with information because coaches have worry they they have so many things on their mind that this is just one part of it. So you um, you give her uh, you have use your time with them very efficiently, and then just just show what is exactly they asked for. And what helped me always has been my uh, performance manager. He always acted, especially in the in the early stages. It was very important that he was a conduit between me and the coaching the the coaching staff. So I would always bounce my ideas off him, and then have a great um, discussion with him and our uh, our head strength and conditioning coach Chad. And we we would discuss this, and then we then um, the final product that goes to the the staff. Uh, is is like a very streamlined and you know very thoroughly baked product. You know, still sometimes we get back you know the uh, uh, kind of uh, feedback where saying, oh, I I think this is still not right or this is still not perfect. But uh, we uh, we try to make sure that what we put in front of them is a fully um, thoroughly thought out product. And would part of your job then be to come up with algorithms or? To answer questions in terms of even load compared to injuries or anything like that, like would would that be part of what your remit yeah. might might be? Yeah. So that was so that was the second you know big back end part of my job is so now that all this so the 
one of the reasons for having this infrastructure is, is it precisely that to see longitudinal trends of, of data and also superimpose data from one data source to another data source because um, all the different softwares and applications and gadgets, they always come with their own formatted data like PDF reports or Excel. Um, it was, it's really like I've seen in other clubs where I visited, there's a lot of silos of information. So the, so the heart rate data is in the heart rate computer. The GPS data is in the GPS computer. It's like you have to ask the GPS guy, <laughs> oh, can you send me the GPS report for this game? And then the other guy. So I, the, my goal was that None of that, just one place, you can look up it, look it up all in one view. And then the other thing was I use R, the, 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 the open source programming language, just yeah. to do more like prediction models and um, you know injuries mainly. Um, and you know, so we've changed a lot of our training this year and preseason this year based on some of the based on the data we collected last year and things that we learned from that. And I mean, so far it's been it's been okay for us this season in terms of uh, what we achieved in preseason and what we set out to achieve in preseason and how it is panning out in the season so far. But but yes, yeah, so that's those are the things that that is the second part of my job was. So obviously, one I'd say to be invited in in the first place, it, it needs quite an open culture to 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 just allow you do what you're doing because I, I, in a lot of times you don't see that. Uh, culture exists from the top down, but obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, it must be difficult for you not to get carried away as a, let's say, a data scientist with, with new algorithms or new discoveries, even even in discussion. Is that where the performance director sort of steps in, maybe, and says, "Look, we need to hold this back or simplify it down for the time being." Yeah, yeah, that happens sometimes, and and, and yeah. So performance director has, has I mean, uh, has been really. Yeah, he, his main job is that there are things like you know you can come up with an algorithm and you you come with some conclusion, and a lot of times you tell that to the coaches. It's it's like okay, so I knew that or I kind of knew that before, right? So you don't want to be wasting their time with something like that. So, so that's how like I would tell Dave, and Dave would tell me, okay, you know that seems fine, but you know I think we should do something more or. That shouldn't be our focus. Our focus should be this. Uh, we would have our arguments, but I think in the end we'll come up with something that's that is going to be useful. Um, you know, if it's not useful, we fail fast. We just throw it away, and then you know, yeah. we, we move on to the next thing. And obviously, sort of analytics is in the U.S. seems an awful lot more popular, and that, that like obviously the money ball and has made it more popular. Is there pressure on? soccer to catch up with the other sports, even though it might be a more complicated sport to analyze? Is there more pressure on an analytics department to prove more results or anything? It's a tough one to answer. I think, I think as you mentioned in the previous, uh, when you were talking earlier, was how top-down there's in our organization. I think I've been lucky, you know, in this organization has been really positive and proactive in that sense. And I don't know if there is there's a lot of pressure um, in in soccer per se, but I think there is general thing like you know baseball almost like I I talked to some baseball analysts and they have they almost every team has like four or five analysts now at least and they do um, a lot of stat and they, they they collect a lot of data they do a lot of stuff in soccer. Um, I know some clubs have uh, analysts now or a lot of clubs have analysts now like not like from a couple of years ago, I think now there's a lot more clubs that have analysts. Uh, but to what level they're doing, I, I don't have, um, I don't have an answer. I, I don't have much insight into what they're doing. Um, that's, I think, one thing that probably over the next year or two, I want to improve. Maybe look, talking to more people. I think between, I, I know I talked to a couple of guys like um, that on on Twitter, but uh, but outside of that. Really, not much of uh, information exchange going yeah. on, and I, and, I think. And, and from your your knowledge of the Premiership or European football, is there a big difference between what's being done in the U.S. and what's being done in Europe? Um, I'd say that I think the performance analysis 
in 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 Premier League to me a lot of it is video analysis. Yeah. That's my impression based on what I've seen. Um, and in that part of it is handled by someone in 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 coaching staffs. So either it's a, it's one of the assistants or either it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's a guy a video analyst with the, with the title video analyst that's been handled that way I think in Premier in MLS because I think all teams use video. Um, but um, but as far as um, the difference, I think in Premier League there's probably more analysts and there's probably more budget understandably yeah. because okay. we're more smaller league and a smaller budget because I don't know any club in, in MLS that has multiple analysts they, if they have they have just one okay so in Sanders case if, if we say you're not like the traditional video analyst you're more on the data side they don't have mm -hmm. a, a traditional video analyst as well do they no we don't as I said you know one of our assistant coaches handles all the video Okay, so so it's covered by that, so and then, the and then you look after up the, the clips after the game. Uh, the, does the video sessions for the team? Okay, and do you do you collect? Does he collect data, or does he just collect videos? So is all the data you get either from the GPS or bought in from somebody like Match Analysis? Um, yeah, so Match Analysis also does stats like Opta, so yeah. they the like the passes, touches, and all that. So uh, they we look at. We look at both, uh, but but yeah. So the so our assistant coach that does the video also looks up those numbers, um, okay. you know, in the in the match analysis uh, database. Um, so I so far haven't integrated that into my database yet. So that's part of my long term plan. So it's it's coming down the pipes probably in the next maybe <laughs> six months. Or so um, also the other the other thing I have is to do a scouting database. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of uh, work left. So do you have a draft system in the U.S. or do you have yeah, a reserve team and all that? So we have a reserve team. We also have an academy, and so we can sign. I don't know the exact rule, but we can sign a few homegrown players. Like if they are part of the academy, the Sounders academy, then we can sign them. They they are not part of the draft, um, and and then the draft is usually. There's, I think, four rounds, but I think the first two rounds are the real, where you get probably the most talented players, and the third, fourth are uh, not so much. Um, I think there's a trend that, that academies are gaining more importance these days uh, in, in the U.S., where um, there's a lot more money invested um, by the teams in their academies, and so we are trying to um, do a lot more work um, Measuring and monitoring them as well uh, in the academy. So we, our academy also has a GPS system, but it's, it's a different one than what we use. Um, uh, and you know, so that's something I think you know going forward we'll have uh, we'll we'll have more interaction with them. Plus, uh, we're gonna get us get us team in the res like so far we've been like using this reserve team concept. But MLS has mandated that every MLS team has to have a team in the lower league from next year. Yeah. So okay. we're gonna have a second team like Sounders 2 or something like that soon, um, and I think that will also mean that we'll need we'll have a lot more work in terms of a lot more matches, a lot more practices because the because I because the practices probably are gonna be different for the two teams because they have a different schedule. So yeah, so all that's that's in the in the pipeline. Future. Yeah, and in terms of the data you get from match analysis, do you have much of a say on what's collected or how it's interpreted? Do you have to do much work with that data, or can you do much work with that data once you get it? Like, do you have to make it more individualized for your coaches or anything like that? Uh, no, not not much today. We don't we don't do much of that. I I think it's part of it. the the physical side of the data is uh is just the like prozone, the total distance covered, high speed sprints, high speed distance, um, and then a few other metrics. Plus, um, that's the physical side of it. The the normal side is more like opta passes, touches, and you know final yeah. third uh, areas and stuff. So there's not much customization we do. I think we we just use we use the both sets of data in its own way. Um, the way we normally use other data. Sorry, I mean, 
the way we use physical data, we, we use the physical data and look at who is doing, how is he doing in the game. And then what we do is that um, one other thing we do is we collect a lot of information, subjective information from the players after the game. Um, you know, how they felt, how they, how is... Yeah. And, and then they have, we have a small app where they can um, tell which part of their body is hurting and, you know, how much in terms of a rating. And we use that to make sure the treatments are all taken care of. So what we do is that we, we collect all that and then we, we just send it to coaches and to just to explaining them, okay, this was what he felt and this is what 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 the coaches feel. So there's always, uh, the coaches also rate the performance of the players. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think the short answer is that we don't do a lot of customization. Yeah, okay. And have you have you made much use yet, or do you? Can you tell me of the the X Y data combined with the um, I suppose with the ball contacts? So you know there was a presentation recently from Prozone just in terms of the game theory. Um, I don't know if you saw it. Just in terms of yeah, I saw that combining both. Have you been able to do any work on that as of yet? Well, that's something that I wanted to do um, early on, and I was actually getting data for it like uh, the ball position plus um, like you know with with match analysis it's they collect all that data so you can get where the ball is every second and then yeah. who, which player has it and also the movements of the players uh, that's something that's on the pipeline but the priority wise it's slightly lower at the moment because it's one of those things where you have to invest a lot of work up front to get to something and I'm 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 hard pressed for time right now, so that's probably like an off-season project to, to to do all that legwork and then have it ready to st kind of prototype and start putting data into a model and then getting some numbers out. Um, yeah, so I haven't done anything with with something like, but that's an idea that I that I had of doing. Like basically, want to um, explore the space. Yeah. On the pitch, like how, because a lot of times goals or goal scoring opportunities are created when you have, um, when you have straight up matchups of two v two, three v three, or or like you have, you hit a flat back line with a through ball and then you're behind and your forward is behind them. All of those are things where to see how space is being created and space is compressed. Uh, yeah, so so haven't done anything with it. So as a as a former product guy at Microsoft. I'd imagine that that's possibly an area where these companies like Prozone or Opta, where they add an awful lot of value if they can do a huge amount of that legwork for clubs. And yeah, and definitely. I think, lot of it done. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely if they can do that legwork, I think it's, it's going to help clubs because and, and analysts clubs because day to day we don't have as much time to invest on those unless we have like a department of analytics where you have two guys just working on, or one guy at least, just working on long-term projects, not on day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah. Because there is a, there's an incredible amount of, um, of focus on week-to-week -week because that's, the, that's what drives the team and that's what basically, at the end of the day, your results from week-to-week -week are going to determine how long you're going to stay in the job or you know, how, how well you do. So, but, but at the same time, the long-term thing is important, but but I think there's a tendency in general that you're trying to concentrate all your best efforts to get the next result, to get the next yeah. result. And that yeah, that's probably comes back to one of those constraints you said at the start, is that, yeah. that pressure to win next Saturday or to perform next Saturday almost trumps the long, as much long-term thinking. If not, it doesn't kill it, but it, it, it certainly pushes it down the priority list. Yeah, so usually when I do long-term stuff, it's mostly on my off days. Like today, yeah. today's an off day. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, usually Wednesdays are off for us unless there is a there's some kind of midweek game or um, or like a Sunday game. But um, yeah, so yeah, long-term things always. I, and I will say this too, like working in a product company, and it's the same thing there too. It's like you want to build this infrastructure for the next two years, but then you t talk all about that, and then you weigh the priority of it with the three-month release. You're going to release on October 25th for the holiday season, and you have this huge pro project you want to do that you want to release a year from now. 
this will always take lower priority. While this might have a lot more value overall, you can explain it, but then when it comes to weighing the two, it's always the one that's going to ship next. That that's the one that's going to take priority, and and that's one thing that I I've realized that th there is not much difference between a product company and and a football team in the sense that the the ship cycle is different. As you, you know, in a product company, you, some some of them ship every week too. I I've worked in groups that work okay. that ship ship code every week. It's a lot like that here. So um, yeah, so I won't say that that's just football only, but I think yeah. that's something that happens elsewhere too. So a question I, I got asked on Twitter a few days ago, do, do you think it's possible for analysts to quantify the benefit they have to a team? Like, do you, do you find it hard or do you need to justify how much you might add to the backroom team of, of a, an MLS club or anything? I think quantifying is going to be hard because I think putting a number, I mean, I just have to pull a number out of the thin air. <laughs> But uh, I think Michael asked that question. I saw that. I thought about it a little while. I, I think the only right answer for the question is it depends, but then it's not very useful. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. So ideally, you would want to say that because of using a stats-based approach or because of using all these analytics, you want to say you won two more games or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, but for me, I think that's going to be a hard one because so the, here is how I can arrive at that, you know, and, and give by giving an example. In a league like MLS, or I think even in the Premier League, the if you keep your best players fit and happy, and you mean best 18 or best 21, that's usually your critical path, like path to success. That means that your best players play most minutes. So, so that means you have better chance of winning. Yeah. All all other things being equal. Um, so so the thing is that so this is how I can justify myself or my work or our work with the sports science and the performance department is that we we're gonna make sure that the guys that are critical for our success are available for the most matches, and and they are the difference makers. Like you know. So, for example, in our case, it's obvious Clint Dempsey, Obafemi Martins. These guys are like are the ones that that are markedly better than anything the rivals can have. So, if we can keep them fit for the most games, have them play the most minutes, it's more likely that they're gonna they're gonna score goals and they're gonna get us wins and they're gonna take us where we want to go. Uh, so, so I think that's that's our thing. So we we do measure how many how how many people are. Um, we do track, sorry, uh, that how many people are healthy given week, how many people are available for selection, how many players, um, how many players of the first 18 versus the reserves are being used, how many minutes they're playing. So I think at the end of the year you make a balance and see, okay, so we made sure that 98% or 96% of our minutes were played by our best 14, 15 players. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's one way of looking at it. I would say that's one way of quantifying it. So um, the injury, the injury analytics is probably easier to justify to a board. You know, if you if you you can prove or you can at least make an argument that this this algorithm or this method has led to less injuries and more playing time, it's easier to justify yeah. that that role. Yeah, I think it's it's much more straightforward to justify that. Okay, you had our best player available for selection for 34 of the 34 matches in the league. Now, technically, you could select the player at all 34 games. You could play him or you could not play him all 34 games, but then at least they were available. It's not yeah. that they were on uh, or injured for six weeks. Um, and then and then the other part, so, so that's one side of it. The other thing is uh, when they say stats which are approached for the tactical side of things, say, you know, whether you pass or how you play or so I always think about certain terms that come up to me or like that used or that that are that are not really number space but I think that are coming with a background in with with numbers in their mind. Something's like mm -hmm. you know in cricket they use the term called percentage cricket. You should play yeah. percentage cricket. You, 
<laughs> where you say, okay, when the ball is outside the off stump, you you try to just avoid it. If it's if it's a test match, you say don't touch anything outside off stump. So that means your chance of getting out is low. Yeah. I think in in football, I always hear coaches or people, I mean coaches mostly saying, take a better shot. Don't take bad shots. So what does mean? What the, what normally they mean by bad shots is don't take low percentage shots from outside the box. Yeah. Make that extra pass. That was something that I also hear. Make the extra pass and the takes take a better shot or make sure that a player who has a better chance of finishing the opportunity. Now you can this is not that they're looking at shot ratios and or you know or they're making they know the person I mean they obviously have seen a lot of football and you the way you keep track of things in mind is you keep somehow you're counting them so I think I think it becomes a little bit more uh, blurred in terms of game performances of how to say that uh, having an analyst help now there are certain things where it will help basically saying things like where it's more it's more scouting opposition where you say oh he has a tendency uh, to to wander onto the you know, so the goalkeeper has a tendency to stay high in his box. So maybe we should test him with a few long-range shots. That so that's the kind of thing where you you shoot at the goal a few times, even though they're bad shots. You just take it so that he's mindful of it, and the goalkeeper changes his behavior. Or if you know a player is very left-footed, then you try to say, or well, try to play, make him play it with his right foot. Now, execution of the of the, that kind of a point is always up for debate. Sometimes you will execute, sometimes you don't. But then when you execute 50% of the time, it's, I mean, you, you can, it's hard to quantify then, okay, because of that I won this game. Yeah. But then all these things add up. So I think it's really hard to put all these things together and say, oh, this helped, or that didn't help. Now, there's another side of it is scouting players to buy players or, or to, to sign players. Yeah. I think there it's a lot more. It's it's a little bit more easier, I think, because you sign a player based on stats, um, and it's never. So I can tell you this: that it's never a single this single person decision. At least in in at Sounders, it's always a group thing, group decision. They look at numbers, they look at videos, and then they um, they make a final call. And then there's always the constraints I talked about early on, like money constraints. Whether, I mean, a thing like MLS, we have salary cap. We have some other rules like number of international players and all of that. I think some of those rules are there in Europe also. So based on that, you you get a player and then you see maybe the year or so. Again, I think at that point it becomes: should we give him one year to say whether your decision was correct or whether you're vindicated? You have to wait two years. Sometimes yeah. it works right away. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah, I, I, I personally, I think it's almost an impossible question to answer because it's there's so many person like signing one player isn't necessarily going to change every yeah. player team. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think overall though, I think it's the process that's going to save you over a period of time. I think you're always going to get things right, things wrong, um, just like anything else in the life. I think if you follow a certain process. And the process is thought through that this is the right process. So why is this the right process? You have that discussion with with the group that is, uh, and then say, well, this is how we have to scout a player. And then you come up with the process, um, you know, and then and then use that process over and over again. Then then I think more often than not, you're gonna get the right type of player that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and and the same thing with with our training too. Like training, a lot of times is just um, it's a. We try to do. Con we we try to keep things consistent, and and then and then we look at if someone's over fatigued or under uh, or under trained. Then we try to make interventions. Um, you know, we we actually one other task I forgot to mention was I am also on the training pitch all the time when they are training, and we're live monitoring the GPS data. Uh, and we, before coming into training, we also have certain targets of what we want people to hit in terms of 
accelerations or total distance or total training load. I have a you know, prediction algorithm yeah. to predict the total training load. Um, and then we look at it and say, okay, you know, I tell my performance manager that, okay, we he hit the ta target we want to hit with this group of guys. And then we we intervene and change their routine at that point. And I think that's that's something that that we I think we're really proud that we're able to do it at Sounders. I mean, to go that level. Um, I don't know if it happens at other places, but I think that's something that we pride ourselves in um, in terms of doing. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask how, like, obviously collecting all that that data and even analyzing it and knowing the results, but obviously operating within a team sport there are constraints in being as individual as you might want to be if it's just a sprinter or a marathon runner or whatever it is. So how individual or how specific can you get with it, even though the data might show you something, it's, it's obviously hard within a team environment. Yeah, so I mean, so we, we monitor a lot of, so we do uh, some measurements uh, with a system called Omega Wave, which does yeah. fatigue measurement. And then we also monitor sleep um, we have our guys wear uh, a watch type of thing, um, and then that just measures the number of times they wake up while they're sleeping, and number of times the amount of good deep sleep they had. Uh, so we use all of that data and then determine whether someone needs a s slowdown in practice or, yeah. or someone needs a. S and and at that point, you know, and because we know the physical characteristics of the players from from testing them preseason you know what his max velocity, his theoretical max velocity is, for example. And if he's hitting that number, um, if, he's getting, if he's not getting close to that number in trainings, then maybe there is some other underlying issue that we need to look at. Uh, and, and, it's, and then uh, sometimes you're, you're, someone is coming back from injuries and you look at how they are able to um, play a small-sided game. Uh, where it's like where tight spaces, a lot of uh, stopping and starting involved, and if they seem to struggle in those games, then we we try to do something remedial and look at what's what's wrong there. So so we don't necessarily uh, have like a individualized training for each player. Yeah. I think that level. I think that's that's as you said, it's not feasible, and it's, I don't know if it's advisable either, but. Uh, what we do have is when we know um, that somebody like you know we have guys that are 20 year old and we have um, 34, 35 year old like when we have Jimmy Triori who's I think 33 or 34, um, you know so obviously this it, it's not one size fits all. We know there are some special requirements for both, but it's but we try to keep as much as possible um, the same. They're doing the same thing, but then. Uh, make finer adjustments for individuals with special requirements. Yeah, and a question there, obviously getting the players to wear watches and to monitor their sleep, to fill in their sort of RPEs, how they feel, their mood and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you get good buy-in from the players, even in terms of wandering over during training, a break in training, to see what their, their, their GPS stats are? Yeah, I think it's good that you brought this up because for me, one of our... I mean, I always tell this to my uh, performance manager is that one of our most underrated achievements here is the the level of compliance we have. Um, and I think that, again, starts at the top. So so we, we get everybody wear GPS every training. And also when they're rehabbing, they wear it. And, you know, GPS and heart rate, you know, there's always situations where guys are going to be like, oh, do I have to wear this today? Yeah. I'm not doing much. Do I have to wear it? We always get them to wear it, and and then um, and and what that does is that we have basically this culture, and and then you know that that whole culture where everyone is doing the things. So we do the RPEs right after one day after the game when they are doing the Omega Wave just to check where their fatigue levels are. Um, they do the they do the couple of surveys, very quick ones, um, and yeah. It, Compliance-wise, we we haven't had any issue at all, and I think that's something of, that we. I think in one way we're lucky, in another way that we the the whole culture is helping us do it. I know I've heard from other clubs and other places where compliance is is sort of an issue, and and the funny thing about compliance 
is that you always have about 50% that will comply no matter what. However, that's the 50% you least worry about or you least have to worry <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah. Because you know that there are guys that are going to take care of themselves and you know very well and they know about their bodies and you know they they do everything they are told to do to prolong their careers and then do do I mean you know that. But then there's other group that that are not as proactive. And those are the guys you need to get them to wear because those are the guys or you want to monitor because you might get a problem, you might find a problem there. I think, mean, yeah, that's uh, that's one thing with compliance. Yeah, I, like it, I think as you say, the, the culture is probably so important. Like if, if it was up to you or the S&C coach to go around chasing players to fill it in, but if it's coming from the performance director, the head coach, even from you know the chief executive down, that this type of stuff, just the culture in the club has to be done, I, I think the buy-in is probably much greater, much easier job for, for you guys on the ground as such. Yeah, because, yeah, much easier. And, you know, like our captain, the team captains, they all uh, embrace it. So it becomes easier for the younger players. And, you know, we always show them, like, okay, so, well, the captain is doing it without asking a question. Then, then you yeah. know, like the, the rookie or the new player, you know, he has to, he really doesn't have much uh, to say at that point. So, you know, some there will be exceptions when they have, some problems to wear the wear the devices because they have some you know issues with ribs or something. But other than that, you know, we get full compliance. And and the apps and all that type of stuff for the ERP is that all something you've been able to build yourself with your yeah. programming? Yeah. So app? I built. Yeah. So I built like a, a small web app which can be opened in iPads. It's not like a iPad app, but it's yeah. more like a website that is kind of customized for the iPad. So I built that, and it's internal site, so it's easy. So um, players can open it on iPads, and um, when they are inside the premises, and they can they can fill up the surveys. Same thing for the coaches that they do some surveys, um, and and the, all of that opens in the, in the computers. Yeah, so I built all of that, and and the, all that data is also going to the same database. So it's yeah. all in one place for us. Okay, cool. I I I I think I know you've made that point, but I I think it's so important. It's, the more devices and the more data you see collected, unfortunately, you see it all collected in its own individual, either yeah. software or even cloud system or whatever. And, and you just see more and more the advantages going to be the guys who are able to pull the 15 or 20 different sources they have together and be able to match it all up. Yeah, I think a lot of time data with uh, data from different sources, uh, the the real value is when you superimpose them together. Rather than, I mean, if you look at it in silo, if the value is 2x, if you superimpose, the value is exponentially more. It'll be yeah. like. Um, so I, a question I asked Brian, and uh, I'll ask you the same: is do you, is there a moment in a game, or even in a training session, or is there any moment where you look at it and say you can clearly see your influence on the team or on something that happened, even a decision maybe the coach has made that's ultimately led to something? Do you have one of those moments? Mm. Let me think about it. Um, I I can't recollect moments like that, but I've seen. Well, I can tell you something different, where a coach would mention, would 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 tell why we did what we did in training, and then say it's because because our guys had done this analysis and they came up with this yeah and so we uh, we adapted uh, yeah so we had a couple of moments like that uh, during the season where our head coach would just say that okay you know they these guys have uh, you know we know that um, um, we know that he's fatigued from Omega wave or we know that from yeah. this and then because of then that's how we change this and that's why we are rotating um, and then also every now and then uh, like um, the head coach would, so we know, so when we send the training report, so my performance manager actually sends the final training report, and he would mention, he would send the data plus some qualifying comments on what happened and you know, what type of training it was, whether it was hard on there, in terms of it was, um, how hard it was. And, and then usually, um, um, it would be like saying, okay, for tomorrow, we should slow down this set of guys because they we know that they're probably going to start over the weekend. 
So yeah. we want to ramp them down tomorrow because they they kind of done a little too much today, and and to get that once we and, and to get that buy-in and say okay next day, 70% um, through the training, uh, the head coach comes and says, uh, Dave, these guys are yours, and so. So I think those are the moments when you feel yeah. like, okay, so what you're doing is, <laughs> is you get a, you get tough times sometimes from from some of them that okay I don't you know I think he can do more work or I don't think he's tired or I don't think but but I think that those are the moments when you know that your intervention has worked and yeah. and there is there is um, there is that uh, belief or there is that confidence in what you said saying okay so that means we can do this oh they said that so. Um, that means it should be we should respect it because they are doing all this analysis. Yeah. So it's always like um, you know a lot of times I think there is the uh, it comes it becomes a the the head coach's opinion versus versus like you know data like someone's opinion. I think yeah. opinion versus opinion always the higher guy wins. Yeah. I think we try to make it we never try to make it opinion versus opinion we try to say okay this is the data you can make your own decision here yeah and and there were cases where you would come where would be situations where we come up with i mean last year we had some we had an injury prediction model where we would predict uh normally when a good guy no no injuries no problems is all fit we would predict about 2% chance of injury i'm talking about non contact muscle injuries but when we have some red flags, the guy would guy's probability would go up maybe 25, 30 percent. So the the common thing would be, well, what you're saying is 70 percent of the time he may not get hurt. That's 70 percent probability that yeah. if I play the guy, he won't get hurt. That is true, and the fact is that you, you don't want to take too many chances of the 70 percent, like two or three games in a row, then you have a problem. But but I think the key is that. A lot of times it's be like, okay, we don't have uh, another right back, so we have to start this guy, or we don't have another central midfielder, so I don't have an option. I have to go with this guy in this game. But I, I see what you're saying, but I still have my constraints. Again, it comes back to that, the the whole the the constraints you work within, um, and and I think that that's where it becomes, uh, it becomes an approach of more of a give and take rather than saying you are correct. Or I am correct, and you know it becomes like more like okay, there's no other option here. We have to play him, yeah. even though he has a chance of getting hurt. So a, a question on the injury analytics, because obviously, in in some sort of way, it's a bit like the holy grail. I think one because it's so quantifiable and it's so, um, you can really attach a dollar sign to the improvement you've made. So if if as analysts and S and C coaches and and everyone in the organization gets. Luis Suarez to play 50% more games than he did the season before that you know you can quantify that to a board so in terms of your own injury analytics stuff how how good do you rate your own sort of theories or algorithms at the moment compared to what you think they might be in a year or two uh, I think at this point we are it's it's a tough question to answer um, <laughs> I think we we still have a long way to go, but uh, this year has been has been good so far compared to last year at this stage. Uh, you know, obviously things could change quickly, and you know, last year we also had we were playing in the Champions League, so we had more games right out of the bat. Uh, so, but this year we don't, so we we've been okay with injuries um, to our to our like main group. We yeah. do have a couple of long-term guys, but those are mostly reserves. Um, Couple of long-term injuries, but but and, and and then but but yeah. So far, we've been good this season. I think I can probably answer that question better at the end of the season, so I can compare. Okay. Um, I think if we continue this pace of of uh, avoiding major muscle injuries, I think we'll be will be at the end of the year. I can say we're better than last year, um, and you know, hopefully we can get and. And again, I think what we so I think all this comes back to the things we changed in preseason, for example, and and that's that's a thing where it's it's you know Dave looks at the data and then he 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 thought he he has some he basic because he has a background he's 
he's able to tell, okay, so let's try to do this. I think this will help us. Now, obviously, he doesn't know it 100% either. I think yeah. you know, why certain things like, so what we saw last year was people covering certain distance in preseason, certain amount of total distance in preseason are more or less susceptible to injuries. And yeah. and then of that, and also they come back. If they have an injury, they come back quickly as well. Now, Dave has some theories about it, where you know it could be due to one or two reasons or three reasons. But we, for example, we don't know for sure. It's because of A or B or C. Yeah. But but we do think that it is important. We 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 made the call and then we've gone with it, and so far it's been okay. So we'll see. Yeah, and I I don't necessarily expect you to tell me what it is. But if there was, is there, to improve the injury analytics, is it just a case of trial and error, or is there data you'd love to be able to collect that you haven't been able to collect yet? Um, I think at this point, it's, it's still, a, the I think the amount of data is what I'd say is, I would say, so I would put it this way. Columns of data is new data types for for something, I say columns. Um, rows of data is just quantity, just having yeah. more data. I think we still have, we still need a little bit, or maybe a season more data, because what happens in football is that the amount of data that you can homo that is homogeneous, as in under same conditions that you can make a conclusion based on that data, is very is still very limited. Yeah, it's not that that huge. I mean, obviously, you'll have training data for a season about I don't know 120, 130 trainings, um, but then again, there is always differences. There is rehabbing people. There is days we have middle mid midweek games. Excuse yeah. me. So we do it differently. When you take out all those, then it it's still like a small data set. Yeah. Um, I think I think types of data in terms of columns and the variety of data. I think we have a lot. Okay. But in terms of quantity, I think we need a lot. We need of we need some more to make more more confident predictions or more confident uh, projections or more confident things. Okay, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, I, I won't. We won't do too much more. We'll sort of try and keep it to, to just uh, about an hour. Of course, have you been able to, or is there any benefit in looking at? some of the performance data from other leagues, like the Premier League or even any other leagues in Europe, and being able to benchmark well, your guys against? That's a, that's a tough one, and it comes up all the time. Um, one reason why we are wary about comparing to Premier League especially, or Premier League or top five leagues in, in Europe, is because uh, none of the leagues have the tr kind of travel that we have. Especially being in Seattle, which is Pacific okay. Northwest, there's only two teams, two places where we can bus. Everything else is a minimum two and a half, three hour flight. <laughs> um, so, um, and then you know we have we have at least five cross country trips to play the teams in the Eastern Conference every season. So that's like six hour going, six hour coming back, and and you know we travel commercial and economy class. So yeah. it's not it's not the most comfortable. So I think. The only league that I would dare to compare us or data with directly is the Russian league. Okay. Um, because they have that kind of travel, and also they play in conditions that are a little bit, you know, there's also stadiums with turf in Russia, and there's also stadiums with, with grass, and I mean, same thing here. We play on turf. Um, four other teams play on turf. So, so I think, you know, with Premier League, that the hardest point, the hardest thing to compare is that it is physically very different type of demands. Yeah, the profile is different. They players don't have to travel that much. It's uh, it's most of the time it's maybe I don't know two hour bus, two hour train, or maybe a, an hour flight. Um, and we have a lot other, we have different constraints. So we look at the studies, uh, the papers that are published in, but but most of them use either Premier League, Spanish League, or German League. One of those. For data because those are easily available, yeah. um, and then we we try to look at the concepts what they're trying to do, and then try to apply the concepts to ours. But data wise, it's hard to compare the the leagues um, to to benchmark to that league because it's uh, the demands are different. 
and and you would you would think that the demands of travel have such an impact on the playing demand like the playing demands then even that that makes it sort of incomparable um definitely i think travel especially cross country travel where we're traveling 5 6 4 5 6 hours uh, what happens is we have to travel a day in advance um i mean we don't travel so so if our game is saturday on the east coast we travel on thursday yeah um okay. so that means and usually thursday is our most important practice um in terms of two days before the game and that's usually where you want to get your this is something I think this is researchers found this I think from from Italy where I think the two days before the game is probably the most important for the training as well as how much sleep you get two days before the game has a lot of impact on on your performance on in the game day so you so we end up traveling on Thursday for six hours and since we're going to East Coast we lose three hours so and and, it, and it's it's also well known research that you need one day per hour of time change to adjust okay. so we're changing three hours but we're gonna play a game within the two day, within 48 hours so it's, yes. it's fully okay. not adjusted so there's all these um, factors that you normally don't do when you're at home um, yeah. and you know and players some of them sleep well most of them sleep well at home and there are a few exceptions that sleep well in the hotel, but you know most of the players sleep well in their own bed. I think that's true for most humans. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So there's all these different things, and you know when you're on the road again, um, um, you know I traveling. The first thing is traveling in economy. Six hours is not fun, especially the the amount of uh, uh, things, especially players for the players. But but we have to do it. That's how it works here. And um, and then once you get there so Friday so we travel Thursday so Friday you just have a light training it's pretty much you miss the training day because you're traveling all of Thursday yeah so yeah. and then you know the day before the game you always have a very light training so so you miss that day so I think yeah travel has a huge impact the big constraint um, okay yeah so I, I have one one question here from from Oliver Cage so the MLS expansion and more TV money. Do you think there's a role for the more uh, what Europe Europe would call the more traditional performance analyst, or do you think that's just a cultural thing that will always that video analysis side will nearly always belong to a, co a coach or assistant coaches? No, I think I think there's gonna it's gonna change definitely. I think they will uh, it it will be handled. Uh, I think more, as you said, like uh, some clubs already have uh, have a video analyst um, that does um, video analysis and and also also do stats on the site. Uh, but I think yeah, more specialized roles will get added. Okay. Um, also, as I said, MLS teams need to own a second team, like in the second div in the third, second or third division. So so that means that you have the um, you have two teams now. So obviously, um, in and in a bigger squad, and definitely you need more people and more specialized people to do specific tasks. So, so I think it will it'll catch up um, in terms of how um, like the traditional performance analyst role in in Premier League. Um, I can see maybe four or five years from now, each MLS team has two analysts, uh, where one of them is is just uh, just a video analyst, another one is probably doing a hybrid of stats and maybe working with the fitness guys or owning all the data like me. Um, yeah, so there's, I, I can see that happen in the next four or five years. Okay, sounds good. And then my sort of last question, because there's, there's usually people who are trying to be analysts, whether that's video or data or anything like that. So mm -hmm. as somebody who's come from the outside and then got in, and the, in the relatively near, near past, um, have you any advice for any aspiring analysts out there and what they should do? Um, I think... Uh, it's that if you really believe in some, if you really believe that that's, if someone really believes that's his goal, you have to pursue it um, with full uh, full conviction, um, take some risks. Um, you know, I have to say I was, I was, I was having a, you know, to be honest, I was having a really comfortable life at Microsoft. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but but the thing is that if you 
a lot of times I, I know a lot of my friends at Microsoft when I moved they were like why are you doing this you have a very stable job and you know but the thing is that I wanted to do this so if you're if you have a strong will to pursue I think you can you can do it uh, so the way you do it is that um, start looking at the work that's being done um, you know, meet people or talk to people on your Twitter Facebook social media and then start your own start showcasing your own work um, and and then and then learn from others that have already done some work um, and try to try to improve on that work or try to go further or try to create a niche for yourself in what type of work you do uh, and and yeah so and the basic concepts are there that okay you first thing is you need to have the passion for the game second thing is uh, you understand the game and then uh, and then understand the game reasonably well and then you know start playing with the numbers so if you don't have the skills for the numbers but you're really interested there are ways to learn like Coursera has a lot of courses that you can learn yeah. um, data analysis um, which are all free except for except for your time uh, and and then and then data visualization is another concept that I use a lot um, for reports and, and presenting data so that's very important so so those are the things and and yeah there are open courses out there there's a lot of uh, you know, there are books out there to do. I think it will take a lot of time. It'll take time and effort, but but I can tell that if I can do it, I think anyone <laughs> anyone can do it. Very so. good. Okay. Well, um, yeah. So we're just about over the hour. So um, I just want to say thanks a million for being so open and honest and answering all the questions and that. And unless you have anything to add, we might finish up there. Oh, uh, thanks. I just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks a lot to you for for your time in organizing this, and uh, and thanks to people who ever joined and listened or asked questions. Uh, hopefully, uh, they weren't disappointed. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's, it was a pleasure chatting chatting with you. Okay, great stuff. All right, and thanks to everybody for watching in. And the broadcast will go live on YouTube in the next hour or so. Okay, so thanks, Ravi. Uh, thanks, Rob. Talk soon. Bye bye. Good night. Bye-bye.